Good evening. Okay, can you hear this in the back of the room? Can you hear it really well? I want you to hear every single word I'm going to share with you. Welcome to the Expo. How many of you, this is the first year for the Expo for you, anybody? Second year. I was here last year and they invited me back anyway. If you're in this room, what I know is that you know this is no ordinary time in the history of our world. How many of you really sense that? I mean, I know you're hearing people say it. Does, it, does the world feel really different to you? In the, last, in the last few months, I've been on every continent of the earth. Not every nation, but I've been on every continent of the earth. And I gotta tell you, it's not just new age thinking, it's not just the American way of thinking. People all over the world are sensing that something very different is happening now. This is a time unlike any other. And it's not just about the economy. It's not just about energy shortages or disappearing resources. Those are, are symptoms of something much deeper. So what I'd like to do, I want to talk to you tonight about new discoveries that help us understand what this, what this shift is all about that we are experiencing. And it is a fact that we are experiencing it. My most recent book, the title is Deep Truth, is the name of the book. Igniting the Memory of Our Origin, History, Destiny, and Fate. And one of the first questions people ask me is, where did that title come from? And I'm going to begin tonight by sharing with you where that title came from. It came directly from a quote from Nobel Prize winning physicist Niels Bohr. In a conversation that Niels Bohr was having with Albert Einstein, in the mid 20th century, 1940s, the two men were talking about the nature of truth. And that during that time, it was the nature of scientific truth. So this is the 1940s. New discoveries were happening seemingly every month. And each new discovery illuminated a deep truth that showed the scientists where the thinking of the past was incorrect. And when I when I saw this quote, I'm going to share it with you right now. This is Niels Bohr talking to Albert Einstein. He said, it is the hallmark of any deep truth that its negation is also a deep truth. The first time I saw that, the first, the first thing I thought was, I said, wow, that's really deep. <laughs> I mean, think about it. What, what he's saying is this. Once a new discovery tells us what we believe to be true is no longer true, the new discovery becomes the new deep truth. And when I read that quote, I said, that's got to be the title for this new book. The new book is the description of the scientific discoveries that overturned 150 years of science. The good news is that new discoveries are telling us where our thinking of the past no longer works. I'm not going to say it's right, wrong, good, or bad. I'm just going to say it doesn't work any longer. That's the good news. And you'd think everybody would be happy about that. The flip side is that there is a reluctance, and in some cases, there is a resistance to sharing these new discoveries in mainstream media, in mainstream documentaries, mainstream classrooms, mainstream textbooks. There is a reluctance to share the new discoveries that could help us solve the great crises that we face in our time right now. I want to be very, very clear before I go any further. When I say there's a reluctance in the classroom, it's not the teacher's fault. In this country, in the United States, every teacher is bound by a covenant with the state that they teach within. They can only teach the curriculum that's been approved by the school board. And if the curriculum does not approve the new science, it cannot be taught. They are required by law to teach obsolete science until the law allows them to teach the new, the new science, the new discoveries. So what I'd like to do tonight, if you like me, you want to know where we're going, I'm going to talk about what's happening in our world. Are we having a series of crises, or are we experiencing transformation, or is it, is it all the same? It's interesting how when one way of living begins to break down, some people interpret it as crisis. Other people interpret it as transformation. Isn't that interesting? I'd like to talk about the false assumptions of science that have led 
to the crises that we're living right now. I want to talk about the new discoveries, some of the new discoveries, we only have an hour, some of the new discoveries that change the way we think, and then what can we do? Wouldn't do any good to talk about all this if we couldn't do something about everything. So I'm just going to begin by saying this. It's not our imagination. We are, in fact, living a time of crisis. The best minds of our time are telling us in no uncertain terms that you and I, this generation, these years, we are facing the greatest number of crises ever to face 5,000 years of recorded human history. Never has one generation been asked to solve so many problems in such a short period of time. We're living what many experts are now calling a perfect storm. It is a rare convergence of natural cycles of the earth natural cycles of the earth that are changing the way we live. They're pushing unsustainable ways of thinking and unsustainable ways of living to the limits. A lot of people think everything is breaking down. My mom thinks everything is breaking down. My, I'll just tell you, my mom, my four foot eight inch tall mom, the language that she uses, my mom says everything's going to hell in the handbasket. That's the way she sees it. And many people believe that. It looks like things are just breaking down and falling apart at the seams for no reason until we look closely. What we find is the only things breaking down are the things that are no longer sustainable in the presence of the conditions that we live in. We are witnessing the breakdown of a global economic system that is no longer sustainable in its present form. We're witnessing the breakdown of the way that we have thought about energy and resources, the way we've thought about food and medicine, all of these things, the world that we have known in the past no longer exists. But nobody's told us. I wish they would just come out and have a special on CNN or Fair and Balanced Fox News. I wish they'd just have a special and tell us the world that we have known is gone. We no longer live in the world of isolated countries, isolated economies. Isolated technologies, defense, energy, communications. We don't live in that world any longer. And because we don't, the way that we've thought about money, jobs, careers, religion, medicine, health, security, spirituality, all of those things have changed. It's interesting, this is an election year in this country. It's interesting to hear how those running for office are promising to go back to a world that no longer exists. Isn't it interesting? It's going, to be, it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. The world is changing because of cycles. In the Western world, we are not taught to think in terms of cycles. We're taught to think in terms of a linear world. But once you leave the Western traditions, almost universally, our indigenous ancestors, the ancients, those who've come before us and those living today, they tell us that the world is a world of cycles. And many of the cycles at the highest level are driven by Earth's location in space. Earth's location in space, the orbit, the tilt, the angle, the wobble of our planet changes on a cyclic basis. Our ancestors knew about this and they told us in the language of their time that our own science is only now beginning to understand it through the language of the ice cores from the poles of this planet, for example. So the scientists know something's up, but they see it from a very, very different perspective. This is a special edition of Scientific American. It was released in September of 2005. Scientists rarely have a voice where they can share their ideas. They don't have a stage at the expo. They rarely get to speak at big conferences with the broad general public. So scientists took the opportunity of a special conference in September of 2005, many brilliant minds came together, scientists, engineers, social architects, political leaders, spiritual leaders. They all came together to talk about what was happening in the world that made our time so very, very different. And the result of the conference was so profound that Scientific American released a special edition to let the world know what the scientists were trying to say. And the title tells the whole story. Look at the title. Crossroads for Planet Earth. The scientists are telling us in their way 
something very different is happening now. But the subtitle is the reason I'm sharing this with you tonight. The subtitle. In this special edition, they talked about the population peak. They talked about disappearing resources of food and fresh water, about the disparity between wealth and poverty and education and literacy. They talked about the economic collapse that they knew would occur. They knew this was September of 05. They knew that the economy would collapse because it had to. It was unsustainable. The numbers simply would not work out over the long term. The subtitle, I'm going to call this to your attention. I'm going to highlight it for you. Crossroads for Planet Earth, that's the title. Here's the subtitle. It begins with a sentence. The human race is at a unique turning point. That's the scientist telling us something's up. Then they ask us, the readers, a question. And this is a powerful question. They ask the readers, will we choose to create the best of all possible worlds from this turning point? They're saying it's not predetermined. It's not set in stone. It's up to us how this pivotal moment comes out. The greatest threats, we're looking at three big threats right now. The threat of a global war beginning in the Middle East, the threat of a global economic collapse that could trigger a war, and how we deal with climate change. Those are the three big ones they're looking at right now. As different as they are from one another, there's a common thread that runs through all of them. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. tonight. It's, it's about the way we think. It's about the way we think. Clearly, we're living a time of extremes. Clearly, they're telling us we've got to act, and we've got to act really fast. My question is how? I was trained as a scientist. I worked for Cisco Systems just right down the road from, from where we are right now. 1990 was the last year I was at Cisco. My scientific mind, when I see so many crises converging into a small window of time, and I see experts telling us we've got to act, my question is how can we possibly act? How can we possibly know what laws to pass, what policies to enact? How can we know what choices of survival to make until we have answered the deepest truths of our existence? How can we know how to answer those questions until we know who we are? 